So with part two of our lecture on late antiquity, we return to developments pertaining directly to the church, which is still in a kind of, uh, you know, working out exactly what it means to be a Christian in terms of practice and belief, also in terms of ethics. And a number of individuals are going to prove extremely important in kind of working these kind of details out. We often refer to them as the church fathers, Right, so some of the most important early intellectual thinkers in the history of the church, and probably none more prominent than St. Augustine, who lived between 354 and 430. So the Roman Empire uh, still existed at that point, though definitely in a state of decline in the West. He himself was born in North Africa, at some point became a professor of rhetoric in the city of Milan in the north of Italy in 384. Uh, and up until that point, you know, pretty much uh, practicing pagan, uh, the, the pagan uh, rituals and so forth, uh, was actually famous for being something of a party animal, like really uh, knew how to enjoy himself. Uh, and two years after becoming a professor uh, of rhetoric at Milan, he had a very profound and moving religious experience uh, that prompted him to convert to the new faith, to Christianity, at which point he went back to North Africa where he would serve as a bishop of Hippo, uh, a city there, until his death in 430. And so he would devote a lot of time, you know, and obviously a very highly educated individual, right? Uh, though his education was of the more pagan variety, but now he's going to apply much of this learning to important theological issues concerning uh, his new faith, uh, and also trying to kind of understand his own personal journey in becoming a Christian. So probably his two most important works, uh, books that he wrote, uh, the first is Confessions, which is really about his own conversion, uh, what you might call a history of the heart, having to do with you know trying to arrive at a deeper understanding of God's saving grace. And the other, The City of God, which defines a what might be called a Christian philosophy of government and history. So the city of God is going to be incredibly influential on Christian thought concerning the relationship between secular and religious authority, right? So first of all, kind of simply the idea that these are two distinct uh, spheres of, of authority, right? So Augustine theorizes that you basically have the city of God, and that represents religious authority, uh, which would have been uh, would have basically been the Catholic Church, uh, eventually the Pope being the more, most important figure of religious authority in Europe. And you have the city of the world uh, representative of the authority held by kings, right? So now some of this reflects a just a recognition of the reality that is emerging on the ground, right? That you're seeing the establishment of these Germanic kingdoms during this period. This is during a period when Roman authority is collapsing. Right? So also the church is emerging as a very uh, important source of authority, particularly in Rome. Uh, you know, what is the relationship between the two? Now, today we have this idea of a separation between church and state, though we generally think of it as meaning that neither should interfere with the other. That is not what Augustine meant. Uh, he recognized that you do have two distinct centers of authority, bases of authority, uh, but the one should answer to the other, right? Secular authority so should, in a sense, uh, subject itself to religious authority, and in fact is only necessary in order to curb the depraved instincts of sinful humans, right? So kings have authority, but it should be in, in the service of the church by way of preparing people for the afterlife, right? To ensure, if you're a king, your, your primary uh, responsibility is to ensure that as many of your subjects make it to heaven as possible. And that provides a justification for secular political authority, which again, is kind of the emerging reality on the ground. Now, Augustine is also very famous for one other very important uh, development with respect to the Catholic Church, right? This kind of uh, promotion of the idea that celibacy is an ideal, that sex is actually something bad. This is something that Augustine uh, would promote very actively, uh, that, you know, ideally a Christian should reject sex entirely, but, you know, of course it is necessary for procreation. Therefore, sex should only take place within the confines of marriage and only for the purpose of procreation. By no means should you enjoy it. Which is somewhat ironic because, again, he had a reputation of being something of a uh, party animal before his conversion, clearly sowed his oats before he became a Christian, 
Uh, but in any event, right, this was a position that would very much be adopted by the Catholic Church and heavily promoted throughout the Middle Ages, eventually even incorporated into Protestant churches. Uh, and arguably, you know, the legacy of this uh, kind of negative attitude towards sex is with us even until today, right? So, you know, if you meet someone who's very religious, uh, you anticipate they might not be too comfortable with the idea of sex outside of the confines of marriage uh, or even discussing sex in any way, shape, or form. That brings us to a contemporary of Augustine's, another of the church fathers, Jerome, who lived between 345 and 420. Uh, like Augustine, was very well educated uh, in a you know kind of proper Roman pagan education, had pursued literary studies in Rome, where he became a master of Latin prose, uh, and then, like Augustine, uh, experienced a spiritual conversion and then dedicated his life to Jesus. And he, you know, even after his conversion, he had a tremendous uh, appreciation for the uh, classical literature of the ancient Romans, the Greeks, and so forth but was concerned about his pagan uh, roots, right? Uh, so he devoted himself to purifying that literature in order to ensure that it was compatible with the basic tenets of the Christian faith, right? Kind of eliminating any pagan elements that would have contradicted Christian teachings. And probably his most important contribution to the development of the church early on was his translation of the Old and New Testaments into Latin creating what we often call the Latin Vulgate. Uh, Vulgate meaning a kind of reference to the common language of that time, which was Latin. Uh, so also sometimes referred to as the common text. And this would in fact become the standard edition of the Bible used by the Catholic Church even until today. So the other very important development during this uh, kind of early period of the, of the church in Europe would be the emergence of the Pope as the ultimate authority figure. So you might remember we talked about how uh, some of the bishops who uh, were based in some of the more major cities of the empire from a pretty early point were seen as having more authority than other bishops, right, and thus exercised a great deal of influence. Uh, in the case of Rome, that bishop would eventually emerge as the recognized leader of the Western Christian Church. And I really want to stress Western here because the idea that the bishop of Rome should have some kind of ultimate authority would never be accepted by the major bishops in cities corresponding to the Byzantine Empire. And so in a way, this is actually the foundation for what will become a schism or a split into the Catholic Church and Orthodox Christianity. And even until today, uh, in Orthodox Christianity, which is the form of Christianity practiced in places like Greece, Russia, and so forth, they do not accept the idea that the Pope has any kind of overriding authority. Uh, now, this idea is based on a principle that comes to be known as Petrin supremacy. And it's kind of the idea, you might remember the reason some cities were considered as having a special uh, measure of authority is because they had been founded by one of the followers of Christ, one of the apostles. In the case of Rome, it was Peter. And the idea develops that each subsequent bishop is a successor to that original founder of the church in that city. Uh, and so there is a passage in the Bible where it, it would appear, I mean, if you interpret it properly, you know, Orthodox Christians would reject this interpretation or say that it's being exaggerated, uh, where it would seem that Christ has given Peter a special kind of authority, referring to him as the rock upon which his church shall be built. And in fact, the name Peter does mean stone. Uh, and so that becomes the basis for this idea that, uh, and eventually the bishop being known as Pope, that the Pope... Uh, should have a special kind of authority, right? He's often referred to as the vicar of Christ, uh, kind of, you, you could say, his, his uh, vice deputy of sorts, right? By the way, the term pope is an anglicizing of the Latin term papa, which means basically father. And some of this also reflects simply the fact that, you know, for centuries, Rome had been the center of political authority. The Roman Empire is now collapsing, and that is leaving not just a spiritual, but also a political vacuum that the bishop there is going to end up filling, right? So, by the way, the Pope is not only the spiritual authority of the church, but will have a great deal of political authority within Rome uh, and the surrounding environs, right? In a sense, uh, the, the, he, will const he will be the head of a political state uh, 
in the center of Italy. Uh, you know, so this didn't all happen overnight, right? I mean, at some point, the popes had become advisors to the emperors, or we might say the bishops in Rome, uh, eventually becoming politically independent. And then, of course, at some point, we no longer have emperors. Uh, the church had, from a pretty early point, really asserted the idea that it should answer to no one. It should be independent of any kind of imperial interference, uh, whether we're talking about Roman emperors or later on kings, right? And this started with Ambrose of Milan, uh, roughly at the very end uh, of the, or towards the end of the fourth century, uh, where he basically kind of spelled out what that meant, you know, in terms of practice. Uh, and this finds a correspondence with what Augustine was writing about kind of a separation into a city of God and a city of the world. The palace is the emperors, uh, or later on the kings. The churches are the bishops, i.e. the pope. Probably the, the, the first really important pope, both in terms of assuming direct political authority over Rome and the surrounding environs, but also in terms of extending his authority over the Christian church in its entirety, would be Pope Gregory the Great. So first, he would be the first pope to assume direct control of Rome and the surrounding territories. Uh, what would evolve into the papal states? And, you know, sometimes they were they would encompass a good portion of the center of Italy. Sometimes they would contract. Uh, the Pope would actually even have an army occasionally waging war with neighboring states, sometimes even heading the army himself. Uh, but in terms of political authority, his primary responsibility was for Rome to provide for its defense, to establish government there and, if necessary, provide food for the people. At the same time, the Pope was very active in trying to extend papal authority over the entirety of the Christian church in Western Europe. The primary instrument for this would be the monastic movement, uh, which we're going to discuss in a bit more detail uh, momentarily, right? But monastic movement made up of monks, people who had dedicated themselves to God, and very often were on the forefront uh, of spreading the Christian faith. And just to give you an idea of what the Papal States look like, we have a map here, uh, color-coded. I think that gives you a good idea of you know, how some, sometimes it comprises uh, more territory, sometimes less. Uh, but of course, always at the center would be the city of Rome. And at the very center would be the Vatican, right? This was basically the uh, home base, if you will, or headquarters for the Catholic Church, where the Pope would have held court. Uh, the, at the very center, we have St. Peter's Square. Some of you might know that today you have what's called Vatican City, uh, a small territory of land surrounding St. Peter's Square in the center of Rome that is, in, in effect, an independent state. Uh, but back in the day, all of Rome would have been under the Pope's authority. So, what is monasticism? It is a kind of movement pursued by individuals known as monks. And initially, it was a very solitary uh, kind of ordeal, right? The term monk, coming from the Latin word monachus, meaning someone who lives alone. And so initially, it would involve these solitary hermits who basically forsook any connection with civilization in order to dedicate themselves to their spiritual growth to God. It's generally considered that the first proper monk was a fellow uh, that would eventually be canonized, hence St. Anthony, who lived circa 250 to 350 in Egypt, uh, initially a very prosperous, wealthy Egyptian who uh, one day got the call. Sometimes that's how we put it. Uh, you know, basically that he felt God calling him, at which point he sold all of his wealth and went off to live by himself in the desert. And eventually other individuals would follow suit. They would imitate him. And so you end up actually with a significant number of monks living in these caves. These are the actual caves where they resided out in the desert uh, in Egypt. Uh, I'm not sure how well it worked out. Eventually they gained a reputation for being very wise. Um, you know, people would come out to visit them, hoping to gain some wisdom. And that kind of, you know, went against the whole idea of being uh, on your own. In a way, they were kind of imitating uh, a particular episode from the life of Jesus where he had gone uh, out into the desert to wander for 40 days. Uh, some of you might be familiar with that story. Eventually, he's tempted by the devil three times, uh, and you know, each time he uh, rises to the occasion. You know, so the basic idea is that you, you know, underlying monasticism, you know, particularly early on, is that you really can't uh, 
uh, achieve spiritual growth if you have some kind of material connection to this earthly realm, right? You really need to sever all ties with this earthly realm in terms of material goods, in terms of, of sex, even in terms of relations with other people, uh, in order to properly focus on God. Now, many other early Christians are going to find monasticism appealable, but, you know, as uh, carried out by individuals like St. Anthony, not entirely doable. Uh, eventually, someone is going to invent a more moderate form of monasticism, and that will be St. Benedict of Nursia, what comes to be known as Benedictine uh, mass monasticism. So he lives circa 480 to 543. And the basic idea here is that, you know, why not have monks live together? Certainly, that would be a much more secure environment. Uh, you know, and it still can be, uh, you know, a very focused existence on one's spirituality and, you know, devoting oneself to God. Uh, but, but this would make it a, a little bit more amenable to people because we are, after all, social beings. So he founds a monastic house based on a set of written rules, right? That, and this will actually end up defining the fundamental form of monastic life in the Western Christian Church. You know, today, if we think of monks, they generally live in a community, right? You really don't have people who go off to live by themselves uh, as monks. Uh, and so this is, in a sense, you know, a kind of moderation. But to be sure, it is still a very hard and disciplined existence, right? If you become a monk, right, you are still giving up all material, uh, all material worldly goods. You're, you're still abstaining from sex. You're still cutting yourself off. Uh, from interacting with most people, you are devoting yourself to to God, basically. Um, and so, you know, if you become a monk, this is this is still a pretty serious business. In fact, I have a very good friend who became a monk, uh, was fairly wealthy, working for the World Bank, had a beautiful house, two cars, you know, a fair amount of money in the bank, and then he got the call, and he basically gave up everything, right? Sold all, you know, his house, his cars, gave away uh, all the money. Uh, he had to charity, which didn't make his relatives too happy. You thought that they might inherit something. And then joined a uh, monastic order, Franciscan monastic order, uh, in Jerusalem, right? Uh, you know, so I mean, some of you are probably familiar that if you're a monk, most of the time you're wearing a very basic outfit. You don't have a very extensive wardrobe. You wear what's known as a habit, this kind of very coarse brown woolen robe, you know, kind of held up with a rope. And most of your time is devoted uh, to prayer, right? I mean, you know, there are many other things that you have to do in the, in the monastery. They tend to be self-sufficient. So, you know, everyone has their chores, if you will. But the primary function uh, of the monastery is to pray for the world, right? Particularly during the Middle Ages, right? That becomes considered to be its primary function, right? That they pray for humanity. Uh, they do the work of God. And, you know, in case you're wondering, right, this is what a typical monastery looks like, right? They would have been headed by an abbot or father, you know, the, uh, the, the individual who had authority over its running. Uh, each Benedictine monastery would have its own land. So, again, they are a self-sustaining community. The primary uh, building in the monastery would have been the church. And then you have other structures around it that would have provided... Uh, you know, uh, rooms for the monks to sleep in. You would have had workshops and so forth. Again, self-sustaining. Uh, very often monasteries have this kind of open courtyard known as a cloister in the center where they might be growing herbs. Also really a nice place to go if you just want to quietly meditate or reflect on God. And then, of course, they would have had agricultural land surrounding it. Uh, by the way, if you ever get a chance, you should visit what is known as the Cloisters in Upper Manhattan. Uh, so it's actually part of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And it is, in actual fact, made up of bits and parts of various churches and monasteries from Europe, but then put together to look like a, like a pretty typical monastery, right? It houses some medieval art. Uh, but, you know, I think more importantly, you really get a sense of what it would have been like to live in a monastery. It's, it's a very pleasant way to spend an afternoon. Now, from a pretty early point, women wanting to engage in this kind of monastic lifestyle as well, but from pretty much from the beginning, it tended to be a kind of communal thing, right? I think the idea that it would be too dangerous for a woman to be living uh, solitarily in a cave like St. Anthony, you know, women uh, under those circumstances perhaps subjected to dangers that, that men would not, 
Uh, so from a pretty early point, even as early as the third century, you have these monastic communities of women in the deserts of Egypt and Syria. And then when it finally spreads to Europe, becoming formalized, we have the first monastic rules for women produced by a fellow named Caesarius of Arles on behalf of his sister. This is in the fifth century. She wanted to become uh, a monk, but we don't call women monks. We call them nuns, right? Uh, and then later on, right, and so again, like a primary concern right from the start uh, to preserve them from dangers, we, we call, you know, when, we, when a bunch of nuns are brought together, we call it uh, a kind of cloistering of nuns. Uh, but, but to make them even more secure in the 7th and 8th centuries, we see the development of double monasteries where we have, uh, you know, monks and nuns residing near each other. So obviously that would have made them more secure, but that does also create some other potential problems, you know, given the, uh, the idea that they should be practicing celibacy, you know, having monks and nuns uh, in such close proximity to one another uh, might prove a bit of a challenge. In any event, it really is worth emphasizing that many of these monasteries and even nunneries are on the frontier, the frontiers of civilization, you know, in the sense of being very far from the territories of the former Roman Empire, uh, but also on the frontiers of Christianity, right? So they're kind of out there on the, the battle lines, if you will, helping to spread the Christian faith uh, and also kind of promoting the idea that the ultimate authority of the church resided in Rome with the Pope. So a number of monks actually uh, stand out in this regard, right? In the sense of uh, they played a very active role in helping to Christianize parts of Europe. One very famous individual would be St. Patrick, who lived circa 390 to 461. Uh, so he was originally from Britain, at some point was captured and then imprisoned in Ireland, at that point pagan. This was when he was a boy. Eventually he managed to escape uh, but then, uh, later on, after he became a monk, would return to Ireland to convert the Irish to Christianity. And in actual fact, I mean, he pretty much converted them single-handedly, right? The founder of Irish Christianity was kind of interesting, as this was really way out there on the frontier, right? Very far from Rome. And the kind of Christianity that ends up developing in Ireland, very different from Roman Christianity. Uh, and to some degree... Uh, not intentionally ignoring, but not really uh, fully cognizant of the uh, kind of structure of authority in the uh, Roman Catholic Church, right? So uh, bishoprics and monasteries, uh, sorry, bishoprics would not really be, uh, would not really play a very prominent role in the development of Irish Christianity. It was much more centered around monasteries. These ended up being the fundamental units of church organization in the North. So Irish monks will be very central to the development of Christianity in Ireland. Uh, one very unique uh, element of Irish Christianity is what are known as penitentials, right? So there's a real, from an early point, real focus on self-reflection uh, or internal examination. They develop these manuals for self-examination known as penitentials. Uh, to be sure, they had a tremendous appreciation of Latin and Greek uh, culture. Uh, but more as it had developed in Northern Europe, uh, in the British Isles prior to this point. And finally, we should note uh, from an artistic point of view that they're very famous for their illuminated manuscripts, right? Illuminated meaning illustrated. Uh, and here you see a page from probably the most famous illuminated manuscript uh, coming out of Irish Christianity, uh, the Book of Kells, right? So, you know, very intricate, very elegant. Uh, a lot of painstaking detail. And by the way, if you ever happen to be in Dublin, you might drop by the uh, Trinity College. If you go to the library there, you can see the original Book of Kells. Very small, but very impressive. And Irish monks would be at the forefront of missionary activity, spreading the faith, right? So uh, somewhat kind of, uh, you know, returning the favor here. Patrick had come from England, had actually come from the Roman part of England, uh, ended up converting Ireland to Christianity, and now Irish monks will come back to the British Isles and convert the rest of it. Uh, so, for example, probably most important in that regard would be St. Columba, who left Ireland in 565 to establish a monastic community off the coast of Scotland on the island of Iona. At that point, Scotland pretty much pagan. You know, by the way, there you have the Abbey of Iona, which you can visit today. It's a very small island on the Irish Sea between Scotland and Ireland. Uh, 
And just, you know, by way of fun fact, we, we might note that the first recorded uh, sighting of the Loch Ness Monster was by St. Columba. Uh, according to legend, he was able to turn the beast around by making the sign of the cross before him. But in any event, he would play a very important role in the conversion of uh, the northern part uh, of the British Isles, right? Uh, northern part of England and what today is Scotland. So while Irish monks are busy converting much of uh, northern uh, Britain to Christianity, the Catholic Church in Rome is also going to be very active in converting most of Europe. Pope Gregory is especially prominent in this regard, and a lot of this is going to happen pretty fast, and it reflects the fact that they're being pretty clever about it, right? Emphasizing persuasion rather than force and a willingness to allow pagans to maintain many of their practices, uh, even some elements of their belief, and even maintaining pagan temples, but just kind of reconfiguring them within the context of the Christian faith, right? So, you know, for instance, pagan temple will be, you know, re redesignated a church. Uh, pagan holidays are become Christian holidays. Probably the most famous example of that would be one of the most famous Christian holidays, Christmas. Now, eventually, uh, Roman Christianity is going to bump into Irish Christianity. You know, the Irish are moving, you know, from kind of the north headed southwards. Uh, Roman Christianity moving north from the Mediterranean world. And at some point, they're going to have to decide, you know, particularly given there are some elements of both that are not entirely mutual compa mutually compatible, you know, have to decide which form of Christianity takes precedence. And they work this out at the Synod of Whitby held in 664, basically in favor of Roman Christianity, right? The Irish monks are going to submit to the authority of the Pope, but in terms of actual practice in the case of Britain, uh, practice and even some elements of belief, what we end up with is kind of a fusion of the two. And, you know, finally, if we're talking about the role of monks as missionaries, as individuals spreading the Christian faith, we should note that English monks eventually pick up the baton from the Irish and eventually start uh, becoming very active in affecting conversions on the European continent, particularly in the north. Uh, one individual that really stands out in this regard would be St. Boniface, who lived circa 675 to 754, who would undertake the conversion of pagan Germans in Frisia, Bavaria, and Saxony. Frisia, by the way, today part of, north, of the northern Netherlands. Uh, that's where my name comes from. Uh, Bavaria and Saxony, parts of what today is Germany. Now, we're going to uh, change topics just a bit because, you know, often when we're talking about the, you know, kind of beginnings of the Middle Ages, you know, late antiquity in some ways kind of uh, demarcating a transitionary period between the classical period of ancient Rome and the Middle Ages, you know, we tend to think of it as a period during which intellectual activity really drops off, right? Sometimes the Middle Ages referred to as the Dark Ages. Uh, and that's not entirely fair. So we are going to note a few important uh, intellectual figures from this period, one of which is Cassidorus, who lived circa 490, 585. He was an official of the Ostrogothic king Theodoric, who at some point withdrew from public life and would write a compendium of Christian literature and pagan literature from antiquity. So among other things, preserving a lot of the ancient Roman learning. Uh, and he also developed kind of a program of study that to some extent is still with us today, right? The idea that you can break down learning into seven liberal arts, uh, which then are further divided into two major groups, one of which is the trivium, encompassing grammar, rhetoric, and logic. So very much reflective of Roman learning, you know, kind of resembling a Roman education. And the quadrivium, which would have consisted of arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music. And we might also mention the Venerable Bede, and this probably reflects a bias of mine uh, in as much as he was a historian. So he lived circa seven, uh, 672 to 735. He was English, uh, had entered the monastery at Jaro in England as a boy where he remained for the rest of his life. And he, he wrote what is probably the most important history of, of England from that period, the ecclesiastical history of the English people which he completed in 731. Uh, it is worth mentioning, you know, at some point, as we really get, you know, kind of deep into the Middle Ages, uh, if you have someone who is an intellectual, he is almost certainly also a monk, right? Really only monks had the time or, or you know, the access to libraries in as much as monks devoted much of their time to preserving literature uh, that, that would have made this possible, right? So he's kind of a good example of, of that kind of dynamic.
And finally, we will finish our lecture with a discussion of some important developments in what is becoming, you know, the Eastern Roman Empire now becoming the Byzantine Empire. Uh, so the western part of the empire is some point gone, and uh, what remains of the Roman Empire very rapidly transforming into something quite different, centered around its capital of Constantinople. I love this map here, like kind of showing, uh, you know, the, the changes in the Byzantine Empire in terms of the territory under their control. And you'll see that even though they do carry on for quite some time, uh, you know, there, there were periods where they're definitely... Uh, a much more significant power in other times when they, they seem to be on the verge of collapse, uh, finally coming to an end in 1453. Well, during the period we've been looking at, probably the most important individual in the Byzantine Empire would be the Emperor Justinian, who reigned between 527 and 565. Now, initially, Justinian had really hoped to reestablish the Roman Empire throughout the Mediterranean world. And initially he had a little bit of, of success. His army managed to conquer North Africa. Uh, we already mentioned how he defeated the Ostrogoths in Italy in 552, but then wasn't able to hold on to it. At the end of the day, probably the major reason for that is he was simply overextended, just did not have enough manpower. Uh, you know, sometimes it's one thing to conquer a lot of territory, it's another to actually hold on to it. Um, and then, you know, but, but even if that wasn't enough, uh, the empire was devastated by the plague in 542, and eventually uh, much of what had been gained was lost. Italy taken by the Lombards three years after Justinian's death. Nonetheless, right, so uh, a number of important achievements by Justinian during his reign. And I should note, mostly he is famous not for his, you know, ability to conquer territory or expand the empire, uh, but for kind of more more what he did at home, and some of it kind of more in an intellectual vein, right? So first of all, possibly his greatest accomplishment was the codification of Roman law. He was very well trained in government and very familiar with Roman law. But by the time he took the throne, let's just say Roman law, the record of it was a mess, right? You just had this mass of materials that were completely disorganized. Part of the problem is in Roman law, they never got rid of anything. If they invented a new law, even if it contradicted an old one, they just, both of them would still be there. So it really needed to be, you know, somehow organized. And he is the guy who's going to do it. Now, you know, when I say he did it, right, I don't mean that he actually sat down and did it by himself. You know, there would be uh, a team of individuals involved. And in fact, there would be one individual charged with kind of overseeing the whole project. So he should certainly get credit, and that would be Trebonian. At the same time, we don't want to underestimate Justinian's role in this regard, right? I mean, he really did, you know, kind of oversee this uh, and kind of define the parameters of how he wanted this carried out. So what does it mean that he codified Roman law? He basically organized it into a number of much more manageable components. And then each component internally would have been well organized, right? So you end up with what is often referred to as the corpus juris uh, civilis, or body of civil law. And it consists of essentially four parts, right? You have the code of law, uh, and that was completed in 529. That was a compilation of imperial edicts up until his reign. Then uh, four years later, they completed the Digest, a compilation of the writings of Roman jurists, perhaps the most important part of this, right? The Roman jurists, these would have been people, this is kind of the commentary on the law, which is how you really understand how to interpret the law, right? Also kind of reflective of various cases and different rulings based on Roman law. After that, we have the Institutes, a brief summary of the chief principles of Roman law. Some of you might remember from the article we had on Roman law, they talked a lot about certain basic principles in terms of how one went about, you know, how one thought about the law and, and its implementation, uh, such as jus gentium, jus naturalis, and so forth. And then finally, the novels, which was kind of, you know, uh, rounding things off. That, that, that was kind of at the end, basically compiling the most important edicts issued during Justinian's reign, right? Just kind of bringing it all up to date. So that is probably his most important uh, accomplishment. We should note that during his reign, he was not the only one engaging in some kind of important intellectual activity. We have a very important historian from this period, Procopius, uh, who lived circa 500 to circa 562, a Byzantine historian. Uh, and a lot of what we know about this period comes from him. 
Uh, so first of all, he saw, served in the army and had gone on campaigns. So that meant that he, he in a way, had uh, he was kind of a primary source as well as a secondary one, right? Someone who had a, a kind of firsthand accounting of Justinian's wars of reconquest, right? Both in terms of what he himself eyewitnessed and in terms of having access to other soldiers. Uh, probably his most popular work, uh, the war is probably his most reliable one. Uh, the one that may be more fun to read, The Secret History, which was a book consisting mostly of scandalous gossip, uh, which doesn't mean that everything in it is unreliable. Uh, but, you know, it seemed to have a bit of a different agenda than simply relating what happened. A lot of it actually going after the Empress Theodora, who we'll talk about momentarily. Uh, he himself, though, for the most part, modeled himself on the Greek historian Thucydides, right? In the sense of trying to, you know, really be as accurate as possible and to use, uh, to use his primary sources, right? The first hand, hand accounts that he looked uh, in a very careful way. Right, not to just take things at face value, but to think about things like plausibility, you know, how to deal with kind of contradictory uh, uh, accounts of the same event, and so forth. But as I mentioned, uh, it was the secret history that probably was most popular, uh, in part because it went after the Empress Theodora, who a lot of people took issue with. Uh, some of it had to do with her background. She was, uh, had formerly been an actress and a prostitute, and now she was the empress, the wife of Justinian. Uh, it was pretty clear that as a very strong-willed woman, she exercised considerable influence over him, something that many people would have frowned on uh, at the time. Many people probably would frown on today. Um, in any event, um, she, you know, in fairness to her, she actually probably proved instrumental at a crucial moment in, in, in preserving Justinian's rule. There, there was actually one major uprising that took place in 532. Uh, it was really kind of a series of riots that, believe it or not, started uh, between the fans of opposing sports teams. So, you know, it's kind of as if like Yankee and Mets fans rose up today. Uh, and started rioting throughout New York, but it actually threatened his reign. And at some point during the riots, Justinian was about to flee. And Theodora basically was like, you're the emperor, you know, get a spine. You've got to stay here and deal with this, right? She, she strengthened his resolve to fight. And that might have saved his reign. Uh, you know, it's just a bad look for the emperor to run away from the capital uh, during riots. Uh, what's really perhaps most important about the riots is what happened after them, right? I mean, they, they really were quite devastating for the city, but this did provide an opportunity for rebuilding it. And so a lot of the most famous structures associated with ancient Constantinople would be built uh, following these riots by Justinian. Uh, most important would be these really formidable defensive walls, uh, you know, on all sides of the city facing the sea. Uh, and th they really would prove to be extremely difficult to breach. I mean, famously so, right? That would be a major factor in, you know, ensuring that Constantinople survived, even when, you know, most of the em uh, empire, uh, most of its territory is being threatened by uh, external forces. Uh, but there were other beautiful buildings that were built during this time, an immense palace complex, uh, the Hippodrome, a huge arena, and hundreds of churches, and most importantly, the Hagia Sophia, which was completed in 537. Uh, so you can see it's still with us today. And this is, you know, by the way, when he built it, there, there wouldn't have been the minarets, these four towers at the corners, right? Those are added on later after the Ottoman Empire conquers Constantinople and the church is converted to a mosque. Uh, today, it's more like a museum than anything else. So, you know, I've been to, uh, today we call it Istanbul. Uh, I've been there a few times, and it's, you know, it really is a very impressive structure. It's very easy to get inside, and it's immense. I'm not sure how apparent uh, the size of it is from this image. Uh, if you look at some of those smaller windows in the center, uh, if I were standing in front of them, uh, they would be about, I don't know, three times my height. So it's really quite large. Uh, you know, by the way, the, the fact that it's converted to a mosque, just so we don't uh, make too, mu too big a deal out of that, that was a very common practice in both directions. So, for instance, in Spain, when, you know, formerly Islamic territory is conquered during the Reconquista, many mosques will be converted into churches. Crusaders will do the same thing uh, with uh, the most important mosque in Jerusalem when they take over the city. Uh, so, you know, nothing to see here. Very typical kind of practice. And, you know, just coming back to uh, Constantinople during the reign of Justinian, uh, 
Well, let's just say at that time, uh, that would probably be the place to be, right? That would have been the most fabulous city at that time. You know, this is a period when Western Europe is, you know, in the throes of the collapse of the Roman Empire. You know, something new will emerge, but, you know, things are in transition. Constantinople thriving. We have a population estimated in the hundreds of thousands, which for that time is like a lot of people. I know from, you know, uh, modern day perspective of a New Yorker that might not sound impressive uh, and up through the 12th century Europe's greatest commercial center this is you know the, the location is perfect right it is the chief trading center for the exchange of products between the West and the East though we should note they do have some of their own industry some local industry uh, probably the most important would have been the silk industry uh, which the state had a monopoly on. So like silk was produced by the royal palace. In fact, you had many workshops that, that were housed there. Uh, so Constantinople is going to thrive for quite a while. So the empire is going to carry on for quite some time after Justinian's death to 1453. But you could say that from that point forward, it, it enters a kind of extended period of decline. Uh, where, you know, territorially it becomes smaller and smaller. Uh, it's going to be confronted by numerous problems, many of which are related to this kind of successive waves of new peoples entering the region that are going to confront the Byzantine Empire. Probably the most serious challenge would be when the Arabs convert to Islam, which becomes the basis for a new civilization and empire. They will directly challenge uh, the Byzantine Empire, uh, in a sense that they become kind of their arch nemeses. Uh, but it isn't just them, right? So, for instance, in the north, the Bulgars and Asi Asiatic people will arrive at some point uh, in, in Southeast Europe. And they very often will come into conflict with the Byzantine Empire uh, and sometimes uh, acquiring territory from them, eventually laying the foundations for what will become Bulgaria. Uh, so, you know, it's again, though, it's going to be kind of a long extended process. It will carry on for quite some time. The last thing we should note is whatever remained, whatever elements remained of its Roman origins, pretty much pretty much gone or, or completely transformed by the 8th century. By that point, you know, it really is something completely new. The Byzantine Empire really can't refer to it as the Eastern Roman Empire in any meaningful way. Uh, but in any event, this is a good place to stop. This kind of wraps up our lecture on late antiquity. And as usual, do remember to check out the questions on the worksheet and respond to them uh, in the appropriate discussion forum.